Before beginning, I'd like to thank John and Bob for their leadership in music today as director and organist for this day of worship, and also for Maya, who was um, our crucifer this morning. Let us join together in a spirit of prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Robert Brown is not a household name to most, even the students of the Protestant Reformation, but he should be. In fact, every one of us in this room as congregational Christians should know about Robert Brown. Brown was an Anglican priest who left the ranks of the Church of England in 1579 to form a group of congregational Christians who became known as the Brownists, not to be confused with the Brownies in Cleveland, also known as the Cleveland Browns. But they were the earliest form of congregationalists. These early congregationalists fought the heavy hand of the church led by the king and felt that they, as Christians, should organize themselves church by church, congregation by congregation. Yeah, it was an idea that started back then. Now, a majority of the separationists aboard the Mayflower, which landed at Plymouth in 1620, were actually Brownists. In fact, the people we call the New England Pilgrims were known into the 20th century as the Brownist immigrants. In 1581, Brown and his followers moved from England to Middleburg in the Netherlands to escape persecution, and there they organized congregations based on the New Testament, the model that they found there in Acts 2, which means that all people serve together, all people are equal, all are ministers. It talks about the way we celebrate the sacraments. They broke up just two years later because of too many internal dissensions. That doesn't sound like congregationalist to me. <laughs> that must be a misprint. Anyway, Brown actually didn't stick with his original concepts. He went back to the Anglican church. Maybe it was his time in prison that turned him around. I don't know. But he became an Anglican priest once again and served out his term serving the mother church. But the Brownists continued. They continued in the Netherlands, the true believers in Congregationalists, and they went on to become our forebears of faith. Now, one of the things that they held as foundational in their belief was the idea that we are a church of covenant. Number one, most important, we're not a creedal church. We gather around our congregational covenants as we live into our call to be the church in the local setting. And these covenants get recited and rewritten and follow along through the centuries. But they are not the creeds. They are different than the creeds. We have to come up with an understanding of who we are, congregation to congregation. This is the thought, this is the belief. Now in our case, our covenant at First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ, Columbus, Ohio, and if you stick around long enough, you can say that without taking a breath. It takes a while, but you can do it. Now, ours started 169 years ago down the street. It was written by our 42 founders and modeled after many other congregational covenants, including the one formed in the Plymouth Church. But there are only three sentences, and I want to take a look at this. Our covenant is really simple. We say it a lot. When new members join the church, we say this covenant. It's printed in our bulletin every week. The first sentence is simple. I want to, I want to lift these up. We covenant with the Lord Jesus Christ and one another and bind ourselves in the presence of God to live together in all God's ways as revealed to us by the Holy Spirit and Holy Scripture. Second sentence the church acknowledges that all members have the right of individual interpretation 
of the principles of the Christian faith and respects them in their honest convictions. Number three, in accordance with the teachings of our Lord, the church recognizes two sacraments, baptism and Holy Communion. So let's take a look at this. Our covenant is with Jesus Christ and one another. If it's not with Christ and if it's not together, it doesn't work together. We're bound together by God to live together in all God's ways, which is really very powerful. That phrase is very powerful. There's lots of things we can learn from one another about the way that we could be together. And I've always liked this. We do this first because of the revelation of the Holy Spirit and then Holy Scripture. Now, any of the Lutherans in the room are going, oh, wait, we put the Bible first. It was very clear the Reformation was all about that. But this Trinitarian peace stays together. It holds together. God, Jesus, and, and the Spirit, the Creator, the Redeemer, the Sustainer. We follow Jesus, we're bound together by God, and we receive all this through the revelation of the Spirit and the Scriptures. We also put the Spirit there to make sure that the Advocate, the one who holds us, really holds us. The middle sentence is particularly interesting and unique. And I love this sentence. If any of you have been members for any breath of time, it's this sentence that you often come back to. It's a sentence about freedom. It's a very powerful statement. We acknowledge that each and every one of us has the right, the right, to interpret the principles of the Christian faith. And each of us also agrees to respect each other as we carry out that right together as we live with honest convictions. This is a very mature interpretation of Christian faith. Now, I'm not your theological overseer, right? And, and, and the church does not make you toe the line and agree to a certain set of beliefs. We don't say, you believe this or you hit the road, my way or the highway. So ours is an open theology. It's an open understanding of how we approach God and one another. We're in this together. And each of us has the right to interpret the principles of the faith differently. Now I know, as I look out on this room and as I have through the years, a lot of you have different opinions about how we do this story of ours called Christian faith. And I love that. That's actually what makes us rich. It's what makes us beautiful. If we were all the same, we were cookie cutter Christians, I wouldn't be here anymore. It would be no fun, right? Someone once told me here in this church that they grew up in a church that was the opposite of First Congregational Church. They said, instead of open and affirming, our church was closed and judgmental. <laughs> so we, we are a unique place, right? There are a lot more of closed and judgmental churches, I'm afraid to say, than there are of open and affirming churches. So I wonder, Here's my question for you today. What do you hold to be the principles of your Christian faith? And how do you interpret them? And when you say this, when you say what you believe and show me how you interpret that, do you know what I believe or Emily believes or Mark believes? We need a whole, this is what we need to do, Mr. Mark, a whole education piece on sharing those beliefs and make room always make room for the other interpretations of the faith. That's what we're in. We're in a covenant that says there's room for all of us. All of us have something to add to this mix. It's very relational. Finally, our covenant wraps up with a very simple sentence. In accordance with the teachings of our Lord, the church recognizes two sacraments, baptism and holy communion. Now, this is truly our statement of faith, if you will. Jesus taught us, actually, I would say commanded us, to do three things. See if you know what they are. He said, baptize, right? Baptize the whole world. He said, when you take the bread, do this in remembrance of me. When you take the cup, drink this in remembrance of me. But he also said something else that we were commanded to do. You know what it was? I, do, I know you know. Larry, I'm going to call on you. What was it? Love, right? Love one another. That's it. Love one another. Now, we don't 
wrap that into a sacrament because that's the thing that holds the whole piece together, loving one another. The first two represent the spiritual and physical elements of the faith, and the last one is a way of life. Simple and splendid, this covenant of ours. On this Reformation Sunday, we are blessed with a covenant theology that's grounded in Jewish scriptures and blossoms in our life together in Christ. This theology is well spoken of in our passage from Jeremiah, which Lynn read so beautifully. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34 tells the story of the new covenant. Now, Jeremiah is talking to the people of old, right? He wasn't writing this for Christians, although we like to read ourselves into this new covenant. And we said, oh, that's our guy, Jesus, right? It makes sense that we would do that. But he's reminding the people of the old covenant, the Jewish covenants of the past, that they've got to get their act together, that they've been too tied and too worried about those tablets of theirs with the Ten Commandments. And he's trying to say, God's going to give you something that you'll hang on to forever, and it's going to be written here, here in the heart. And if you can't own something in your heart, then it's really not yours. He says that in all their stumbling around and misinterpretations, they've lost track of what really matters. The heart is what matters. It's the heart that carries the covenant. And it's the law of that heart. It doesn't need to be written on tablets. As I said, it, it, it's inside of you. You have to internalize it. You have to carry it. A deep fidelity with God goes with that covenant. And that covenant is for all of us, for all time, to feel connected with God. The covenant community which emerges in Jeremiah lives in the full knowledge of God. And what is that full knowledge? Well, Jeremiah tells us throughout his writing what it is. In one place, in Jeremiah 22, 15, he says, well, here it is. The full knowledge of God means that you care for people who are poor and needy in your midst. The full knowledge of God means you give everything that you have to others. There are lots of other qualities that point to the full knowledge of God. And one of them that we carry into this season, this stewardship month, is that whole idea of how do we nurture, engage, and encourage one another in the fullness of God's love by living and giving generously. We embody the fullness of God's love in many, many ways. But we're being called upon by the stewardship leaders to embody it as stewards of what we're given. I was asked by someone this past week, how our church puts together its budget each year. And I said, well, we count on the generosity of our members and friends. They step up and they give till it feels good. And then they give more. The person looked at me like I'd lost my mind, right? That doesn't look like a way to build a reputable budget. To which the whole meaning of my life and ministry passed before my eyes. I said, well, it does call us to the deepest part of who we are. It calls us to kindness. It calls us to generosity. It, it's, a, it's the part that matters the most. It's the best way to build up our faith and respond in love. And then the person changed the subject. Understandable. You see how this works, though? You are in covenant with the heart of God and with one another. As a steward of your covenant and a steward of your heart, you open your heart and you share it with joy. You become more generous with each contribution, each gift, each investment you make. You know this is true because in each of our lives when we've done something that's gone outside of ourselves and we've given something that's passed beyond who we were before, we're, we feel better. It just happens that way and we begin to feel the deepening of our commitment and connection with the church and with one another. Years ago, I heard two older members of my church talking loudly before church, and like me, now with my hearing aids, I think it was they were hearing impaired, I'm not sure, but they were like the Muppet characters, Statler and Waldorf. These, they, they were famous in my last congregation, not my last congregation, the one in Cleveland, yeah, the one two congregations ago. 
These two old guys would get together and they would talk really loud all the time. Sorry about that. And they had a critical analysis of everything. The pastor, of course. The organist, of course. The choir, of course. And of course, the whole church. One day, one of them said to the other, you know, our pastor can't preach. To that, you should say amen. But anyway, this was long ago. And he said, the hymns are terrible. The choir can't sing. This was churches and churches ago, so don't worry. It's really bad here. Nothing gets done around here. Nobody cares about the place. And then the other guy responded, well, what do you expect for a buck a week? Yeah, <laughs> right? You get what you pay for. For those two guys, they were given a buck a week, and that's what they came away with. So you get what you give, right? Right? If you don't give yourself over to the movement of the Spirit and the love of Jesus and the connection with God, as we're talk, talked about in our covenant, you, that will also reflect in your giving. The question becomes, is it everyone and everything else but me? Or is it me that I have to look at? Now, for my two old guys, Statler and Waldorf, let's call them, it was about everyone else, right? So there's probably a balance <laughs> somewhere in there. But we really do need to take a look at ourselves because it's when we do that we find out who we really are and what's in our heart. Through the years, I've found that when I show up, when I open up, when I listen up, when I learn, I am moved to share and to give. It's just the way it works. And I'm changed. And I show it then in the generosity of my heart and my soul. So we are God's covenant people this Reformation Sunday. That's who we were cut out to be. And I want you to reflect on your commitment this Sunday, your covenant with this fellowship of faith here in this room and those of you who are joining us virtually. I want you to think about this. I put it this way as I close. If you're new as a member, or if you have just been coming through the pandemic time and found us as a friend, I invite you in these days of Reformation Covenant to invest, to find a way to start up, perhaps giving, or to step up in giving, to give generously. It's really a good time as you've been out there watching this interstellar creation called First Church in orbit during pan the pandemic time to come aboard and join us. It's time for you to invest, be a giver as you uh, are join with us in participating. And secondly, if, if you've been here a little while and you've not yet made a choice to pledge or to give, or maybe you're just given a buck a week or something like that, you know in your heart it's not really making an impact. This would be the right time and the right way to change. Invest in the church that you say you belong to. Give something to it so that the mission and ministry of the church can actually meet ministry goals, which are really big. We have big dreams for what we want to do here. It begins with generosity. And finally, if you've been here a long time, and maybe a little long time or a real long time, however long you, you imagine. We need you more than ever before. Next Sunday is All Saints Day. Actually, tomorrow is All Saints Day, but we will recognize all who have died and gone to the Lord in this last year. And we will remember the 12 members who have been here and through the years made a tremendous difference in this congregation. As covenant people, we have to acknowledge they're gone, and it's time for us to step up and fill their shoes. I remember a story years ago with Dorothy Cromarty, who truly embodied the widow's might. She was a hairdresser here in town, and she was all full of love, worked for faith mission, served in this church generously, and on the All Saints Day, following the death of about 10 of her friends, she said, with very small resources on a very fixed income. It's time for me to step up and fill in now that they've gone before me to heaven. 
Wow. It depends on how you look at things. Now, for those of us who knew and loved Dorothy, you know that's how she looked at life in general, right? That's how she looked at faith in general. But she stepped up. She doubled her pledge that year. And it was the most glorious gift I'd ever seen given to the church. As a covenant people, now is the time for us to step up. In John's gospel today, Jesus declares to those who are listening, you know, the truth will set you free. And he's right. It's true. When, when we hear the truth, when we know the truth, when it comes to us, we become free in it. We know what we've been looking at before might have had elements of the truth, but then it comes clear and it's, it's crystal clear what we need to do. So we no longer stumble around. We no longer wonder who we are or what we are or where we're going. We, we know that it's true that we have to do something different, that we have to step up. I think of that when I think of Robert Brown today. He knew that it wasn't working. This church that had been lost in this time in history, he knew that things had to change. And so he said, I have an idea. Let's return to the New Testament. Let's return to the first Christians and set our model for church just like that. You see, that's so clear. I pray for you today that things become clear for you too, that you find the freedom that you have as you explore the principles of your Christian faith, that you share those beliefs with others, and that you accept and receive the beliefs of others who don't share any of the same ideas with you, you're going to learn more from them than you ever dreamed of. Because they're here. They're in our church. We're all together. And I pray that once we're grounded, we respect and celebrate one another's convictions, our honest convictions, and hold this faith dear to our hearts. And as we live into the freedom of our covenant, I pray that we may be generous in giving and in supporting the mission and the ministry of First Church in this present moment and in the time ahead of us. Thanks be to God. Amen.